Today in Pop Goes the 60s, we're going to talk about the revelatory tape from September of 1969 of the Beatles meeting where they discussed the follow-up album to Abbey Road. We're going to talk about what's on the tape, we're going to listen to a little portion of the tape today, and you're going to find out why Apple prevented Mark Lewis from using it in his Hornsey Roadshow, here on Pop Goes the 60s. Yes. Back in September 11th of 2019, Richard Williams of The Guardian wrote a provocative article on the Beatles titled, This Tape Rewrites Everything We Knew About the Beatles. Somewhat grandiose because it doesn't rewrite everything we knew, but what it does rewrite is that the Beatles were possibly going to record an album after Abbey Road. So the reason Richard Williams was doing this story in the first place is because he was covering Mark Lewison's Hornsey Road Tour, which is the 50th anniversary of Abbey Road. And uh, on the eve of the tour, Mark got some bad news. I was given about four and a half, nearly five minutes of this meeting tape. It actually runs about 50 minutes, apparently. And I'm, as you can imagine, desperate to hear the rest of it. And I hope that by the time I get to write about it, which will be volume three, I will have heard it all by then. So far, I've only heard a bit that circulates amongst a small group of people. I'm not the only one who's got it. Uh, and I certainly don't own it, but I have a recording of it. Mm. So I have this tape and I was intent on playing bits of it uh, in my touring show, Hornsey Road, because it's it's so fascinating mm. um, in terms of the content, what they're actually saying to each other in this meeting. And I um, played it to the journalist Richard Williams, the ex-Melody Maker journalist, now writes for The Guardian, who came to my house to do an interview with me to promote the tour or at least to <clears throat> highlight the fact that the tour would be happening. Mm. And I played it to him and I, I actually hadn't realised it at the time, being somewhat naive, I suppose. But as as the journalist, he obviously realised that's the focus of his piece. And that being, this being the 21st century, just flew around the oh, world in, in about five minutes, courtesy of the internet. And suddenly everyone's talking about it. And that brought me and that tape to the attention of Apple Corps. Mm. And um, on the very eve of the opening date of the tour, I heard from Apple um, with a very strong suggestion that I do not play it. Really? And I took advice and um, I, I realized I had to row back a bit. Really? Um, because I didn't want the, I wanted the tour to go ahead. I didn't want it to be stopped. And people had bought tickets by this point. And, it, you know, mm. I took the pragmatic view. So Mark's legal advice said that he could play a small part of it, or it was agreed upon that he could only play a, probably about 45 seconds of it. And then he couldn't do any other quotes of the rest of the tape. And that he could only paraphrase. Richard Williams in The Guardian called it the eighth in error, and that's how it's gone around now as the eighth, but it was the ninth, it was 9969, and it was at Savile Row, and uh, Ringo was in hospital for, with uh, just under observation um, for a problem with his intestines. He wasn't kept in for long. Mm. He's forgotten about that hospitalization because when he did an interview with the BBC recently, he said, I was in hospital in 69. Oh, I don't think so, yeah. but he was. Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, there's a, an account of John and Yoko visiting him in hospital. John records this for Ringo. I That's mean, right. you yes. know, uh, because he couldn't be there. And that tape is around. And I've got four and a half minutes of yeah. it. And uh, do we think it's 50 something minutes? Yes. Yes. Yes, I believe so. And yeah. it's been quoted at length uh, in the Anthony Fawcett yeah. book. If you want to know yeah. most about that tape, find that yeah. book. And, and it's in one or two other places as well. But really, that is the primary knowledge of it, that, that book. Mm -hmm. Um, I was accused by um, certain people of coming up with a tape that they didn't know existed and mentioning it to a newspaper without them even knowing anything about it. And my response was, but it's been quoted <laughs> at length in, an, in, in a Lennon-endorsed book because one day at a time by Anthony Fawcett was endorsed by John and Yoko. It was done with their blessing. Mm. And uh, I couldn't know that they didn't know that. And it reminded a lot of people about that book. And, and there's several pages book. of it. Yeah. Several pages. And so, yeah, so the, the, the thing about 14 tracks is that 
the Beatles always had 14 in their mind. I, I realized this a few years ago, that when they're making an album, whenever they made an album, if they had done, say, 10 tracks, they would always say, oh, we've got four to go. So when he's saying how we divide it up, it's four plus four plus four, and two for Ringo if he wants them, which is fine. Which that would have taken up heavy not. I guess so, yes. yes. Very good. But they're not shortchanging Ringo, because obviously he's barely writing yet. Yeah. But even still, they're giving him two if he wants them, yeah. um, which is great. And I did read somebody say, what a disastrous idea that would have been. But why, why would it have been why? disastrous? It, it would not have been disastrous. Yeah. It would have been four great Lennon songs, four great McCartney yeah. songs, and four great Harrison songs. I'm going to play a snippet of that tape in a moment, but uh, Mark was referencing the Anthony Fawcett book, One Day at a Time, which is this book. And Anthony Fawcett was John Lennon's personal assistant during this time. And when he wrote this book, I'm convinced he had the actual full tape because when he, he writes about that meeting, he's quoting the tape verbatim. I mean, he couldn't have been told what happened and then wrote it. He had to have heard the tape. So that's, the tape is, I would almost say it's transcribed for us in this book. Now, there's another YouTuber that I really like named John Heaton, and he goes into and reads many of the passages from that chapter on his uh, channel. I'll put the link below. Uh, but let's uh, listen to what John had to say. It wouldn't it be better because we, we didn't really take them, mm -hmm. you know, for you to do songs that you dug and for Obadiah and Maxwell to be given to people who like music like that, like Mary or whoever it is that needs a song. Why don't you give them to them? The only time we need anything available in that quality is for a single. And for an album, we could just do only stuff that we you really dug. It's easy mad for us to put a song on the album that nobody dug, including the guy who wrote it, just because it was going to be popular. Because you know? uh, the pop LP doesn't have to be popular that way. That little part of the tape, uh, John is talking about Maxwell Silverhammer and some of the difficulty the band had recording some of these songs. So Mark had a little background on that discussion. Here's what Mark says. The prelude to what John said, it must have been a couple of days earlier, because he's, John is referencing something that Paul had told to him a couple of days earlier, that he didn't rate Maxwell Silverhammer or Obla D Obla Da very highly either. And John has obviously been thinking about this for a couple of days, saying, oh, yeah, we, we hated those tracks. We really, really didn't enjoy the experience, even though John wasn't on Maxwell. Yeah. He knew that George and Ringo had hated it, so on their behalf, he's saying, we really didn't enjoy what you put us through on those mm. two songs. And now for you to say you didn't really rate them very highly either, so why the hell did we do that? Why did you make us do that? Yeah. Why did you put us through something that even you weren't that passionate about? Mm. And Paul must have said it would be to make the album popular because there would be popular songs. I mean, yeah. Obla Di Obla Da has this reputation now that we know about, but in reality, it is a great song. Mm. And it was a number one single for the Marmalade. Uh, and it was, it's in the Beatles canon of great songs. Yeah. But uh, evidently, Paul had kind of put it, planted it in those albums because he knew it would be a kind of popular number. Mm. And John is saying to him, albums don't have to be that. Why didn't we just do it as a single, or why didn't you give it to Mary or someone who needs a song like that? Why did you make us do it if you didn't even really rate it yourself? <laughs> exactly. It's revelatory to hear yeah. that. And it's also revelatory to hear the even-tempered way that John says this to Paul. Mm. He's not shouting. Mm. He's not even angry. He's just perplexed. It's just like, you made us do this thing, and you didn't really believe in it either. So let's analyze this a bit. When John throws out the idea of equal songs for the three writers and then Ringo with a couple extras if he wants them, uh, obviously that sounds pretty reasonable to me. But what happens, it seems like, is Paul right away said, well, I didn't think George's songs were that good until now. Now, I guess if he said it this way, something like, well, now I think George's songs are really good, then George wouldn't have replied the way he did. So as it turns out, nobody agreed to this formula, which to me is a little bit strange because George Harrison was going to say, no, no, four songs is too many, one or two will do me just fine. That would, that's probably what he always wanted. But what's interesting, in a, an interview uh, just several months later, in 1970, he said this about it. You know, it, it was just difficult to get in there, and I wasn't going to, you know, push and shout but it was just over the last year or so we'd worked something out which was still a joke really three songs for me three songs for Paul three songs for John and two for Ringo 
but uh, that is the main problem, you see, because I mean, why even, did Ringo only get two? Well, because that's uh, fair, isn't it? That's what you call being <laughs> fair. So George really had the most to gain by having equal amount of songs, and as he said, it's 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 a joke. I mean, is it a joke? I mean, isn't that what he wanted? So I don't really understand. You know, just months later, he's making light of this suggestion when really he's always stated that he wanted equal time anyway. So that, it's he's I, I don't understand why he's taking that approach. It doesn't it's contradictory to what he wanted in other interviews and what he had said. So I guess no progress came from that meeting from 9969. And I wonder if Ringo even ever heard the tape because just four weeks later, John Lennon quit the band. So it seems to me that had that meeting gone differently with the new album formula proposed, if Paul would have said, yeah, that's a great idea. George, yeah, you give you four songs, you totally deserve it, let's do this. They probably, we probably would have had another Beatle album. So in retrospect, this tape destroys the myth of the Beatles knowing that Abbey Road was gonna be their last album. So thankfully, we that myth is destroyed. Um, hopefully, we'll get to hear this whole tape someday. I mean, Mark Lewison is hopefully going to write about it, but I hope we get to hear it someday. So in one of my next videos, I'm going to talk about what this album after Abbey Road would have sounded like and looked like. So if you want to stay tuned and want to know when that video is coming out, just hit the notification bell, give me a like, and give me a comment because the YouTube algorithm really likes it. And it's free. See you next time on Pop Goes the 60s.